Hi, thanks for joining us. You're listening to the Health Essentials Podcast brought to you by Cleveland Clinic. I'm your host, Cassandra Holloway. Today we're broadcasting virtually as we are practicing social distancing. We're joined virtually by the chairman of the Respiratory Institute at Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Raid Dwake. Dr. Dwake, thank you for taking the time out of your day to speak with us. Thank you for having me. So right now, many people are looking to their healthcare systems for answers. People wanna be ensured that their hospital has the capacity as well as the capability to care for them should they need it. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the steps and protocols that Cleveland Clinic is following to manage the current flood of COVID-19 patients, as well as how we're preparing for the surge of COVID-19 patients. Before we dive into all of that, we wanna remind listeners that this is for informational purposes only and doesn't replace your own doctor's advice. So Dr. Dwake, I first wanna start off by asking, um, can you tell us a little bit about your role at Cleveland Clinic pre-COVID-19? So I'm the chairman of the Respiratory Institute at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, which is home for the departments of pulmonary medicine, critical care medicine, infectious disease, as well as allergy. So at least three of our departments are at the forefront of this fight, as you may recognize. Yeah. So since the onset of COVID-19, how have things changed for you and your team? So once we uh, were aware that the uh, first case was identified in the United States, uh, at the Respiratory Institute, we really went into high alert, trying to gather as much information as we can to prepare. And once the first case in Ohio was identified, we really went into all hands on deck uh, situation where we're really starting to learn again as much as we can, connect with any people who experienced this before so that we'll be ready. So when our first uh, admission happened to us on uh, Friday, the March the 13th, we were prepared to take care of it. I like how you mentioned that kind of the all hands on deck approach, you know, people yes. sort of jumping into action, you know, immediately about this. Absolutely. This is the kind of situation where that's the only way to manage. Absolutely. So I want to talk Cleveland Clinic on a bigger scale. What has the health system done to protect um, the caregivers, the patients, and the community? So at the Cleveland Clinic, we have been proactive about all these things that you mentioned. From, from the very beginning, uh, we started to make sure that um, we limited visitation hours, for example, and not even just hours, but even the number of people to visit. So really, there are very uh, strong restrictions on that. We also measure the temperatures of everybody who comes into our buildings, whether they are a caregiver or whether they are a patient or a visitor. We also hand, uh, recently started handing over uh, face masks, these cloth masks that are important for cuff etiquette. We have like sanitizing stations everywhere uh, throughout the, the system, you know, and at the entrances of all buildings. We've also limited the number of entrances that are open so that we can control access to our buildings as well. So really it's been uh, a transformation in how we uh, get patients in and out and watch for people who may be sick to get into our facilities. Absolutely, and, and we've read a lot about Cleveland Clinic also postponing those non-essential procedures and, and moving a lot of what they can to virtual appointments. Correct. So actually, uh, our uh, uh, appointments, our outpatient appointments have, uh, of course, gone down significantly, but the number of those that we do virtually has skyrocketed. So we went almost like 70% of what we do now is virtual in the outpatient. In the inpatient, as you also pointed out, uh, following the governor's directive to uh, delay or postpone non-essential surgeries, we've been uh, uh, following that order as well. And that has helped in many ways to preserve the uh, uh, personally protective equipment that we need for taking care of these patients, but also uh, realign our caregivers so that they're ready and uh, to take care of these patients as well. Absolutely. And I loved how you um, referenced um, Dr. Or Governor DeWine, you know, and how, how we are so closely following um, his, his guidelines and that communication um, so, so clearly. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the communication between, you know, our, our president and CEO, Dr. Tom uh, Mahalovich, and how he is, is communicating with Governor DeWine? Yeah, they are really in close communication. Uh, I had a conversation with Dr. Mihalovic just a couple of days ago, and he had just got off the phone with, uh, with Governor DeWine and uh, the health uh, director, Amy Acton. It's really been close collaboration, and I, uh, my understanding that Ohio was divided into three zones, the northern, middle, and southern zones, and the Cleveland Clinic is coordinating with the state 
uh, looking at the, uh, the care of patients within the northern zone, which includes our catchment area. Great. So we know that Cleveland Clinic is actively caring for patients with COVID-19. Can you talk a little bit about some of the best practices that you've seen your team um, who is directly caring for these patients, uh, the best practices that you've seen from them? I know you mentioned uh, previously about PPE. Absolutely. So lots of things we learned uh, as we prepared for uh, the, the taking care of COVID patients. The first thing we did, which I think helped us quite a bit, is to put all these patients, uh, what we had on main campus, in one place. We call it the COVID unit. And actually, they refer to it affectionately as COV1, you know, because the area where we take care of these patients. So there's, there we learned how to minimize the use of PPEs while keeping our caregivers and patients safe. Uh, one of it is uh, some of the things we learned is, for example, is how to do appropriate donning and doffing, putting on and taking off the protective equipment. And one thing we recognized very early on is that this is not something we are used to doing day in and day out. So we found it very helpful to have somebody watch you while you put them uh, on and off to make sure you don't make any mistakes. And that really prevented us, I think, from uh, having unnecessary exposures. Uh, and that has been great. Other things we've learned from this unit is things we have never done before, uh, including having uh, the anything we can have outside the room. Uh, we put it outside the room to, again, minimize exposure of our caregivers while continuing to take care of the patients. For example, IV pumps, uh, dialysis machines, ventilator controls, all of those uh, we worked uh, diligently on putting them outside of the rooms and now has become uh, common practice for us to do that to move everything from equipment-wise from the patient's bedside to outside of the room, correct? Yeah, the controls of the equipment. Of course, still the patient has to receive the IV, the dialysis, or the ventilator, but the way to control them, change them, go up and down, uh, manage them, we can do that now uh, while still outside the room, which is a major uh, uh, advancement. One, minimizes the exposure, but two, also minimizes the use of personally protective equipment, which is, uh, as you know, there's been a national uh, shortage in these and preserving them is very critical. Absolutely, and I, I love the um, the idea of this buddy system that your team has implemented as well, kind of watching each other and looking out either before going into the, the patient's room or and coming out as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've passed the point of only preparing for COVID-19 because we know it's here and we know it's our reality. What else is Cleveland Clinic doing as we continue planning for the bigger surge of patients when that does happen? So we continue to learn as we take care of our own patients, but also we have reached out uh, to other areas where they kind of experienced this before us. You know, we've early on, we reached out to colleagues in China, Italy, the United Kingdom, and more recently, uh, Washington State and New York uh, City to learn uh, from the things that they have experienced and learned. And I think the more you talk to these individuals uh, and experts, the more you recognize it really boils down to three things. I call them the three S's. Everybody has calls them that, that now, the space, staff, and stuff. Space, we mentioned a little bit, which is talking about um, how to cohort these patients in areas that are highly specialized so the teams can get used to taking care of these patients. The other one is staffing. And that involves multiple levels, not only physicians, but also nurses and respiratory therapists and other healthcare professionals, including advanced practice providers that can take care of them as a team. And we have to kind of, uh, in a way, uh, teach them and they have to learn how to take care of COVID specific issues, not just critical care in general. And the third uh, issue is, for the lack of a better term, we call it stuff, which is ventilators. As you know, there's a lot of talk about ventilators being in short supply and also personal protective equipment. And we've uh, uh, really have been uh, paying close attention to these supplies in our institution, as well as uh, ways to kind of minimize them and reuse them if, uh, if possible. So I want to ask you a little bit about um, when you, you mentioned the three S's, if we could talk a little bit about the staff. Um, so I know that there's been talks about kind of a labor pool at Cleveland Clinic and, and retraining or training people who aren't used to being in one position into another position. Can you talk a little bit about that, that reassignment kind of that's happening right now? 
Yeah, of course. So um, clearly, uh, physicians in our institute in pulmonary and critical care and infectious disease are at the forefront, and they are taking care of these patients uh, already right away. As you recognize with uh, now the canceling or postponing of non-essential surgeries and non-essential procedures, a lot of uh, Cleveland Clinic caregivers who are really not very busy right now, but they uh, uh, could help if they were just given some extra training. So we have done a lot in the last uh, few weeks to prepare educational materials uh, for them, to have them ready to uh, help in taking care of these patients. So we are looking at it as multiple levels of training. One, our critical care physicians and caregivers needed to learn about COVID-specific care, and we've done that already. The next thing is people who don't routinely do critical care, but may be called upon in case the number of cases becomes uh, high, and those they need some refresher of how to take care of critically ill patients, and we've done that as well. We also have developed uh, learning modules for individuals who may not take direct care of these patients, but may be useful in taking care of other patients while uh, everybody else is busy taking care of the COVID patients. So it's really a multi-pronged, multi-layered approach to education, paired with, of course, identifying which uh, caregivers would fit in either category so that we can find out what kind of training they need and make sure they, they get it. I'm curious, have you had a lot of um, staff kind of raising their hand to volunteer to learn different areas or help out or pitch in where it's needed? I'm telling you, it's, the response has been unbelievable. You know, I, did, I never expected that. Everybody wants to help. Everybody wants to just teach me, show me how to do it, and I want to help. That really has been the unanimous uh, response pretty much from everyone. And uh, usually when I have my daily calls with my institute, I describe this as, for us as healthcare professionals, we have been preparing for this over our lives, and this is like a calling for us. So really, I think I felt the same way from everyone. When, when there's nobody that I asked to help that has not stepped up and helped, which is amazing. That's so encouraging to hear. Absolutely. And so I also wanted to ask about, you know, the three S's, space, staff, and stuff. Um, what about uh, space? Can you talk to us a little bit about the, um, the surge hospital that Cleveland Clinic is planning for? Yes, so uh, as you know, the Cleveland Clinic has the largest number of ICU beds in all of Ohio, so that we already have a lot of uh, ICU beds, which is good to start with. Having said that, you know, if you look at the initial estimates, uh, the number of patients we are expecting to have may far exceed that number. So the clinic has done multiple things in that regard. One, uh, look at inventory of our ICU capacity, intensive care unit beds, and make sure how much we can expand. And we can expand them several fold, and that's already undergoing. The other thing is looking at non-ICU beds and where uh, can we uh, have them, uh, more of them as well. And the third step, which you alluded to, is looking at alternative sites, areas that are not traditionally uh, 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 areas where we take care of patients, but can we convert them to do that? And the biggest one we are involved in is the health education campus. As you know, this is a large building on our campus that is being transformed uh, into a hospital that and can accommodate up to a thousand beds. You know, I can watch this every day from my office because actually it's literally outside of my office and I see the trucks coming and leaving every day. It's been nothing short of impressive uh, how quickly they were able to do that. So we've talked a lot about um, the physical things that, that Cleveland Clinic is doing to protect their caregivers. I wanna talk a little bit about what Cleveland Clinic is doing to help protect the emotional and mental state of their caregivers, especially those on the front line. Can you share with any, any best practices that Cleveland Clinic has implemented for their caregivers' mental health? Of course, you know, really this, uh, as you know, caregivers for us is the, uh, always at the forefront because if you can't take care of your caregivers, they can't take care of our patients. So that's something we deeply care about at the Cleveland Clinic. And there are things that we've done within the Respiratory Institute, for example, uh, including um, uh, a few months ago, even before this happened, we appointed a, uh, an institute wellness officer, which like, we, could have, we didn't anticipate that we'll be using her services so much. And she's really stepped up into action and she's developed uh, these neighborhood groups, for example, people who live next to each other to kind of, they can connect with each other with chats to help uh, uh, each other, not only at work, but also outside of work. Uh, we've also uh, have uh, developed these uh, 
comfort areas for caregivers just outside the areas where are very busy with, with have snacks or drinks or a place to relax in the middle of a hectic day. Also, the Cleveland Clinic has a 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week caregiver hotline for any concerns or emotional support that they need, and that's available for all caregivers, uh, uh, and it's staffed by behavioral uh, health specialists, and that's been uh, a great support uh, as well. Of course, to me, I think the most important thing we've done in supporting people is communication. People in these uh, times of uncertainty like to know. And uh, again, uh, our CEO has made it uh, a point very clear that what he knows, we all know. There's full transparency. And I've taken the same thing within the Respiratory Institute. I have a daily meeting uh, with uh, my leadership uh, every day to discuss everything. And also every day at noon, we have what we call it a COVID pulse check call, where we have a call with the entire institute to answer their questions, give them update, and see what's on their minds as well. So I think all of that together has uh, hopefully resulted in a lot of support for our caregivers. Absolutely. I love that message. The continuous communication um, should really help with this, this, this peace of mind and understanding the issue and, and everything that you know, Dr. Mihalovich knows, all caregivers know. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the last thing I want to ask you about here is about research. Can you speak to us about any COVID-19 research that's going on at Cleveland Clinic or how that's being handled? Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things about COVID is currently no proven or approved treatment for the disease. So while you hear a lot about certain medications or certain things out on the internet and the public, there's really no approved treatment currently. So the only way to be able to develop good treatments is to study them and research them. And the Cleveland Clinic, again, is on the forefront of this. Since the beginning of uh, um, the pandemic, we've had requests, I can say, of over 30 uh, different studies uh, to, uh, to study other interventions or tests in these patients. And we have put together a team uh, that uh, looks carefully at all these studies and selects the ones that are most useful and more scientifically sound that can advance the science of treatment of these patients. So we are about to launch uh, the first study in the next few days, which is looking at uh, hydroxychloroquine in patients with uh, COVID to see if it's effective or not. As you know, uh, there are reports out there that it may be effective, but they have not really been very robust reports. So the best way to do it is to study it. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you said, research is such an integral part of um, solving this puzzle. Absolutely. Because it's a, a new virus. We don't know a lot about it. There's a lot more we don't know than we know. And the only way to, to get some answers is to do it in, a, in an organized way. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Dwight, for taking the time to speak with us today. I know so many people listening, myself included, uh, have found what you've said and shared really valuable information. Thank you so much for having me. And again, I think the important thing to remember our listeners is the importance, I cannot overemphasize the importance of keeping the social distancing. I know uh, that cases in Ohio have been uh, relatively stable uh, recently or not rising as fast, but that's because of social distancing. Social distancing works. It's working. We need to keep it until we are sure that uh, the worst is behind us. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's everyone's sacrificing right now for the greater good and, and it's, it's working and we need to continue doing what we're doing. Absolutely. For the latest news about COVID-19, visit clevelandclinic.org slash coronavirus. If you want to listen to more Health Essentials podcasts featuring experts at Cleveland Clinic, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from or visit clevelandclinic.org slash HE podcasts. And don't forget, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Cleveland Clinic, all one word, to stay up to date on the latest news and information about coronavirus, as well as your own health and wellness. Thanks again for listening. Take care of yourself and stay safe.